finally, after some delay, uh, we've got Lab 6 here. This video guide will take you through it and really give you everything you need to know. Originally, the intention was to have you follow along and do these analyses on different data sets, and uh, we could generate some data that way and look at uh, some ops and genes in organisms that maybe hadn't been explored before. Unfortunately, the logistics, again, were a little bit more than I anticipated. There's been some software issues with the platform that we're going to be using, this discovery environment that you signed up for in the last lab. Um, so you won't be able to follow along and do everything. However, hopefully this will give you a nice kind of bird's eye view of the process. So at the beginning of lab six, I've created an outline of procedures. We've already talked about and actually completed phase one. So let's go through that, and then the next part of this lab will go over phase two. So the phase one is generating the raw sequences that we're going to need to look at the transcriptome. So to do that, we do an RNA extraction, and in fact, we can even add here then, uh, there's a number of steps actually here, but one of the important ones is we go from, we, we turn it into cDNA. So we'll call that cDNA synthesis. DNA is much more stable than RNA, and so it's a much better molecule to work with. So we use a reverse transcriptase. We take all of the mRNAs in our sample, and we turn them into cDNA. We break them up into small pieces, and we create a library. Part of that library preparation will also include adding a tag or an adapter on the end. And we'll come back in here and tell you why that's important here in a little bit. And then we send them off for sequencing. Now, modern sequencing machines have much more capability for each sequencing run that you do than for a single transcriptome. So you can do many, many different transcriptomes on a single sequencing run. But to do that, you have to mix all the samples together. So to make sure that we can tell what sample came from what original tissue, we add these tags and adapters onto the end. So for instance, for one tissue, you may have DNA sequence. Just put ends here for random DNA sequence. And then at the end, you have a random adapter. They're longer than four base pairs, but they are unique and distinct. And then for a different DNA sequence, again, whatever the DNA sequence is here represented by ends, and then you would have a different adapter on the end. And so at the end, you could look at all of your sequences and say, hey, if it has a, this adapter on the end, it's from sample one. If it has this different adapter, it's from sample two, and so on. And you can do a few, a dozen, depending on the capability of your sequencing run and how many sequences you need for each of your samples. You can do many different samples in a single run. Okay, so the end result of it is, if you want to log on to the discovery environment, you can do that, but it's not necessary. Uh, the end result are these files here. Uh, we'll look at, at one of them. I'm just going to open up one of them very quickly. This is a finished file, and it's only going to open up the first little bit because it's a very, very long file. So here I've got a unique, you know, algorithmically identify, uh, generated identifier for that sequence. The sequence itself, all C's and T's, which is a little weird for this one, but you know, we'll look at others and we, we could go down through them. Um, and then we've got quality control scores. So those numbers there, so these first four lines are for the first sequence, the next four lines are for the next sequence, and so on. Um, and we end up with this massive, massive file. So we have 87,000 um, uh, pages that we would need to look at each of this size. You know, this has a couple hundred maybe, or maybe, I don't know, maybe 100 or so sequences on it. Um, and we have 87,000 pages to go through. And that's just for this one um, sample. Now, we would want to go through these sequences and do some quality control. So that is the first step. And so that's what we're going to walk you through here for this next part. We'll look at some questions here for section two. But for the assembly of our sequences, the first thing we do is a quality control of the raw reads. And basically, we run it through a program that looks at the sequence um, quality scores and then also does some other metrics on the sequences themselves. So for instance, if you're seeing lots of sequences with all T's and C's and very few A's and G's, there's probably something going on. We would expect to have those sequences roughly uh, equal, those nucleotides roughly equally independent. So, and again, this is where we run into some problems. You could follow along, but I won't have you do it. But on the discovery environment, we have data that we can store. You can share it with collaborators. You have apps that you can use, and then you can look at the results of analyses that you run, uh, that you analyze your data with those apps. You can look at the results. 
One of the apps is a quality control assessment. And you can run through that and do it. Uh, I won't show you how to do it again. It's not important for this stage of the lab where we're at. But the end result of that is a file that looks like this, a summary of the results. And it'll tell you areas that are good and areas that you might need to be aware of for future uh, downstream analyses or that maybe we could trim out some things. So one of them is this, uh, the quality, which looks very high for this, right? So we've got everything in the green range, good quality. Um, the quality scores are very good. Um, everything gets a green check. But then we've got these areas that we may need to investigate. The only one that I'm going to have you look at is one that we call um, the K-Mare count. Um, sorry, or K-Mare uh, content and overrepresented sequences. So basically this means sequences that we find, and there may be more than we would expect on average. Um, so um, if if those are found there, so this one is found at 0.5% of all sequences, right, have that one in it. So that might be a sign of, oh, maybe there's some contamination that's brought on. It could potentially be a very, very overrepresented gene, but um, we might want to investigate that later on. Could be contamination, could be an overrepresented sample, um, could be some artifact of the analysis itself. So the end result is a bunch of information and data that we can look at for the quality of our overall sequences. So let's look at the questions to determine um, kind of some of the possible results from this quality control of raw reads. So first off, review, why are adapters placed at the end of the sequences? Well, that allows us to um, eliminate things that might be uh, very, very um, different. I'm sorry, let's back up. That allows us to separate is the word I'm meaning. It allows us to separate sequences from one tissue versus another and still put all of those on a single run. And those adapters are automatically cut off the end before the raw sequences are presented. So what is done with raw sequence reads that have very low quality measurements? Those would be eliminated. We just take them out of the assembly. What is done with raw sequence reads that contain highly repeated sequence? Well, if that's the case, there may be a number of possible outcomes. If we identify it as a contaminating sequence, maybe from a virus or bacteria or human contamination, right, if we're looking at insect sequences, but we get a little bit of human sample in there, we could just eliminate those and just say, let's take those out from our raw sequence reads. Um, if uh, it was identified as an insect sequence, maybe we just flag it and say, oh, let's look at this later on. Um, the other possibility is if all of the adapters were not taken out, one of those highly represented sequences might be an adapter sequence. And so then, it go, of course, we just want to trim it out, and we could use the rest of the sequence in our analysis. So either eliminate contamination, trim out um, adapter sequences that were not removed, or possibly, uh, you know, flag a sequence for later analysis downstream. Okay. So once we have done this quality control and assessment, the next step here is going to be that we want to assemble our transcriptome, okay? And so we won't walk you through the process of that, but I'm going to show you the end result. And this takes usually several hours, sometimes more, depending on your uh, uh, computing process and, and memory allocation for, for the run. Um, the one that I'm going to just show you again, the idea was to have a number of them available, but we're just going to take you through one because of time constraints for the semester. The one I'm going to show you is uh, for MBOptera or web spinners. Some of you, a few of you are familiar because you were assigned this in a previous lab, but most of you probably don't know much about web spinners. Web spinners are, are uh, insects. They're interesting for a couple of reasons. I'm going to highlight two. Um, you don't need to know these specifically, but just kind of to give you some background that, so you're, you can have some context for the transcriptome that we're looking at. Um, web spinners, as the name implies, are able to spin silk from their front legs, which is a little different. Spiders and other, many other organisms spin silk from other silk glands. Spiders have silk glands at the tip of their abdomen. Uh, web spinners can spin it from their front uh, tarsi, but their front legs. So they're actually a little bit more like a true Spider-Man, if you will, who can shoot, you know, this fictional character can spin webs from his, his front legs, right, from his hands. Um, where, and these guys can do the same things, whereas spiders do it from the tip of their abdomen, which would be a very different thing for the Spider-Man cartoon. Might make it harder for him to, to swing through uh, New York City uh, if he's spinning silk from his abdomen, I guess maybe from his belly button or something. Anyway, <laughs> so... Somehow, Embiopter Man or Web Spinner Man doesn't quite spin off the tongue, though. So, 
And uh, then the other thing that's interesting about web spinners is that males are completely uh, winged. They have full wings, can fly. Females are wingless. So it's kind of that interesting sexual dimorphism and, and has an interesting spin on the development of wings. So this transcriptome that we're going to be looking at is actually from the assembly uh, uh, from the um, the head. It's a, it's RNA that was taken from the head, and so that would we would expect that to have those opsin genes and other genes that are expressed in the head also. Okay, so let's look very quickly at the end result of the assembly, and I've got it here on Discovery Environment. Uh, again, you don't have access to this, but for time's sake, you don't need to look at it. Um, so here we go. This is the output, the end result. It's actually a much, much smaller file because we've taken all of these millions and millions of raw reads and assembled them into thousands or tens of thousands of um, assembled sequences. So here we go. This is what each one looks like. Now, some of them are going to be very short, only short sequences that we're able to put together, only a couple hundred base pairs long. Um, and each one gets its own unique name, sequence one, and then down the line, um, comp one, comp seven, and so on down the line. They each get their own unique name. Now, as we go down, if this is a really good sequence, um, and we might need to jet through some of these a little bit. In fact, let's just pick a random one somewhere in the middle. So we have 2,000 pages to look at. Let's look at page 1,000. Okay. Uh, so here we go, a much larger one. This one is 1,700 base pairs long, which is a really good indication that, oh, look, we probably have found um, a gene, and there is its sequence. Okay. Now, there's still some quality control issues here on an assembly that you can do. One of the things that you can do, and this is looking at this very last step, I won't ask you a question about this, but looking at this last step here of quality assessment of the assembly, it's hard to tell sometimes because you don't know 100% what to expect. In some ways, transcriptome assembly is a little bit of an exploratory research. We're just going to say, hey, let's see what's there. So how do we tell what the quality is if we don't know 100% what, to, what we're expecting to find. Well, one of the things, actually, let's do a question on this, okay? I'll, I'll put one right here as we're doing this. You'll need to answer this. We'll answer it here for you. But um, one of the ways that we might do, do this is how might we assess the quality of a transcriptome assembly? I'm going to let you think about that. You can pause the video here if you want to think about it for a little while. But I'm going to give you a hint. Remember early in the semester where we divided genes into three different categories? Think about what those three categories of genes are and how we might use one of those categories to assess the quality of our assembly. Okay, so if you paused it, have you got an answer? Great. So remember that let's do the three um, categories, right? Which were um, what we called housekeeping genes. We, we looked at tissue-specific genes. And then we looked at uh, these important developmental genes that we call toolkit genes. So a housekeeping gene, remember, is a gene that we would expect to find pretty much in any cell. There are genes that are used regularly all the time. Cells use them for metabolic or other physiological functions that are pretty much always necessary. So if we had a sample and we say, oh, look, we would expect to find these insect housekeeping genes in this insect tissue that we found. So let's look and see if we can find them. And if I have 100 different housekeeping genes and I'm finding 95, 98, 99, or 100% of those housekeeping genes, that would give us a good assessment of whether or not we had a representative or a thorough sample uh, in that of uh, those sequence genes in the transcriptomes, right? So the answer here would be use housekeeping genes and see what percentage of them we're able to find in our transcriptome assembly, right? So there are some quality control things that we can do. And there's some other more complicated ones that we won't get into. So now that we have a transcriptome assembly, what do we do with it? We've got a putative transcriptome, okay? And so we're going to be looking at this third part here. So I'm going to add some things for section phase three, section three, uh, that we are going to do it. Now, I'll talk about this last one, but I'm actually only going to demonstrate and do this first one, which is identification of target genes, okay? So... Let's take a look at things that we could do to identify specific target genes, okay? Now, the key is here is, oh, if I have sequence, I could compare it to known sequences, right, that are already published, that are already online. It would allow me to see and find what that gene is. Now, in this case, because there's been very, very little work, there's been some, but there's been very little work done for MBOptera. 
I might not expect to find the exact same, a really, really close match, but I might see to find matches in other insects that have been sequenced. So let's just, for the heck of it, let's take this very first one that we were just looking at. So I have this um, gene, right? Um, it's given a random name, uh, gene number 18,294, that's 1,700 base pairs long. Let's see if maybe I can identify what this gene is. But realize I've got more, I've got probably 30,000 potential genes. Some of them might be contamination or just a little tiny short piece of a gene. So in reality, although this might be kind of cool and I can do it, and we couldn't do this. We can run these through programs. It's fairly computationally intensive and get matches for every single gene. But then I'd have to sort through all those, even if it's just looking at them one by one to say, oh, what's the name or the closest uh, matches? What are the names of the closest matches? Even that's going to be quite prohibitive. So we're going to look at it in a slightly different way, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. And you, you can actually do this last part if you want to. I'll give you access to this file, but you don't have to. It's, it's just kind of an interesting uh, exercise. But as long as you understand the concept and watch me do it, that will be fine. So what is the way that we can identify genes based on similarity? That's a pretty simple, nice, straightforward question. So let's make that our first question for section number three. Okay. And I'll give you this. You'll have this document. You can answer questions. I'm going to put some of these questions in a, a lab questions uh, assignment. You'll need to do that. So do all these questions and you just cut and paste your answers into that. And that's rather straightforward. So let's do section three. Um, and section three is analysis of our transcriptome assembly. Let's just call it this. Okay, so we want to find genes of interest. And so I, like I say, we could kind of do a needle in a haystack approach and look and do each one. So question number, I guess it would be number five here. Um, how do we identify individual genes in the transcriptome? Now, the very short answer, and I'd actually be okay with this, is we could simply do a BLAST search. So you remember that from previous labs. A BLAST search, I, an easy kind of shorthand, it's kind of like a, a Google search for genes. And it takes a sequence and compares it to all known sequences on a database. Okay. So to do that, what we would need to do is go to a database, NCBI, right, is the... the uh, federally funded database where all genetic data is there, and we'd say, let's run a BLAST search. Okay, now I cut and pasted that. I think I did. I might have to cut it again. Now, typically the best one we could do nucleotide blasts. It's actually a little bit better to do what we call a BLAST-X search. Um, T-BLAST-X is the one I want. And what this does is it translates this RNA sequence into a, it looks for an open reading frame, translates it into a potential protein sequence, and then gives you genes that match that. So that one's actually a little bit easier, better to do. Oh, sorry, cut and paste that. So let's see if we can cut and paste our sequence here. I've highlighted just the DNA sequence. I'm going to copy it, and then I'm going to paste it here into this folder. Okay. Now, we could also maybe make our search a little bit faster by saying, let's just limit this just to insects. So rather than comparing it to everything, let's only find close matches within insects. So I'm going to run a BLAST search, and let's see what the results are. These typically take anywhere from a few minutes or a few seconds up to a few minutes, but usually not much longer than that, and it will continually refresh. So random needle in a haystack gene, if this is an opsin, it would be a miracle because we're looking out of tens of thousands of, of potential um, genes of these assembled sequences in this transcriptome. But that's our idea, right? Say, hey, I want to find the opsin genes. So maybe as this is running, start thinking about, okay, how would I go through and find all of the opsin genes that are, are, are in this um, database, in this uh, relatively small database, right? Because the database online that it's searching now, it's taking 32 seconds so far, is a huge, huge, massive database. Um, but I've got a smaller database, so in some ways I kind of would like to do a reverse, uh, where I'd, I'd say, well, what if I could take a known sequence and put it on my small transcriptome database to find a match, rather than taking an unknown sequence and finding something in the massive online database so that I could identify it? So, 
All right, so here's the end result of the search for that just one gene that we randomly picked out of the transcriptome. Now we'd limited our taxons to only searching for insects, and then we've got a list of all of the results. Now, you probably don't recognize species names. Oh, here's a Drosophila, that one you might rec recognize. Bombyx is the silkworm. Nasonia is a um, wasp. So we're getting insects, which is really great, looks good. And not only that, but we're getting fairly consistent results. Notice almost all the matches are either, well, we're not sure it's a hypothetical protein, or it's an actin. So we've found an actin molecule, probably something from a muscle or maybe within the cells, right? So this might even be a good housekeeping gene. But all of the matches are actins in insects. So that's a really kind of a slam dunk that, oh, look, we found this specific gene. But now we're faced with this other issue. We say, okay, great, we found an actin, but I don't want to do that for 30,000 other potential transcripts in this transcriptome. I want to find just the opsins. So the way that we do that is basically a blast search, but we are going to create a local database. And so instead of searching the generally complete database, we want to search a local database. Okay, so I'm going to put an additional question here in our um, lab, which is, how do we identify a group of target genes in our transcriptome? All right, so you can find... Um, you know, an indiv any individual genes of transcriptome, you can blast it on the general database, but we could do an exhaustive search, right, which would take a lot of time and energy, and we don't really want to do that. So you could put that as an answer, but I want the better answer, right? So we could make a local blast database and then use a known gene, search our local blast database, and find all of the genes in our local database, our transcriptome, that match that gene. So that's the answer, and I'm going to demonstrate how to do that here, uh, and you guys can follow along. Okay, so to do this, first we need to find a gene with which we can search. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to the NCBI database, and instead of just picking a random gene out of our transcriptome and searching for it, I instead am going to find an opsin gene in an insect. We'll just, we can pretty much use any opsin gene in any insect, but I'm going to go with Drosophila. All right, so let's go back to our main page here, and I'm going to search for nucleotide. Ba -ba -ba, LMN, there it is. Nucleotide, and I want to find an opsin gene. Now, most likely, Drosophila is going to come up here. I can, um, oh, look, that's a mouse. Oh, there we go. Drosophila melanogaster opsin gene. So that's an easy, nice one to start with. Uh, I'm going to look at the FASTA view. It's a nice, simple view. Oh, this one is missing chunks, so maybe it's not the best one to use for searching because it's got some pieces of it that were unknown. So let's try this one and take a look at this one. And we could even, you can actually make a list and it will search all of them. So if I wanted to do all the different types of opsin genes, but most likely I'm going to be finding, because all the opsin genes are related to one another, they're all part of a gene family, I would be finding the same genes over and over again. So really just one opsin gene is going to be enough for this search. So let's take a look at this DNA sequence. Okay, so here we are. Looks great. No missing areas. Um, it looks like um, we've got the complete coding region. Um, so I think, in fact, let's just, the only thing I want to do is I'm going to change this because it looks like we might have the whole gene. I want only the coding region. So there it is. These are the uh, exons that are marked. The introns are unmarked. So I'm going to get that version. So I don't have the whole gene itself because transcriptomes have all of the non-coding regions uh, uh, marked off, cut out. All right, so here it is, and it's in FASTA format, so I'm going to take it here, and I am going to paste it just into a regular old text document. All right, uh, and let's get rid of the... I don't want it text wrap. There we go. Okay, so this one actually is a little bit... I just need to change the format a little bit because I've got all of these um, carriage returns, so I'm just going to replace those. Um, so that basically I have a very simple FASTA format. Uh, with this long name, I don't really care about all this information, so I'll just leave, I'll cut off and keep the name a little simpler. 
complete coding region. So here we have it, the name of the gene, Drosophila melanogaster opsin gene, and then the sequence for that gene. And I'm going to use this as the source to search all of my transcriptome. Everything in my transcriptome, I'm going to find matches to this. So it's really a blast search, but on a local database. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll save this. I'm going to put it in the same folder where I have all of my other um, stuff for this analysis, and it's in 3406 transcriptome. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just save it here. Now, I've already gone ahead, and so in this folder, I have my... Um, I don't know why I didn't change the name of it, so we'll, we'll call this Drosophila opsin. I have my uh, gene sequence to search. I have the program, the BLAST program. We're going to use the tBLASTx again. And then I have um, my uh, database. And I've taken this web spinner database and I've created a searchable database. So all these are just support files that were made as I created a searchable database. And there are other platforms that will do this. If you ever need to do this, if you're working in a lab, it's kind of a, a specialized thing. I, I'm happy to show you how to do it. But I've created all the tools that we need to do it, and I've got the program here that will allow me to search for this Drosophila opsin. Okay, so now I have all of the tools that I need to search for matches to this opsin gene. And this is just simply a text file uh, in FASTA format with the Drosophila opsin gene in it. I've got my database here that we assembled. It's a transcriptome database. And then I've got the program that will allow us to search to do a local search. Now this program does not have a graphical user interface. It's actually a command line. Because you don't have to do it, I won't spend too much time, but some of you may be familiar with command lines. So basically what I have to do is navigate to the folder that I'm in, and then I have to give this program commands. So here we have the program we're using, tblastx, and then the query, which is the one, the sequence that we're going to be searching for in the database, and there's the name of it. And then the database we're going to be searching. So database, search this one. And then if we want to, we can give it an output. So I've told it to put the output file in this one. It'll go into the same folder by default. So I'm going to run that. It's a rather quick run. There we go. It's done. And it's generated this uh, file for us, web spinner opsin, from uh, that original tissue. So I'm going to open this up so we can take a look at it. So here are the results. It gives us a little bit about the version uh, of the... Um, software we're using. It tells us the, the original database that we're searching and some information about that database. So there's th almost 30,000 sequences in this database, a total of 14 million uh, nucleotide letters. And then it gives us our results. So here are the significant alignments. And by default, it gives us, I think, the first 20 or so, maybe 25. Um, and notice that here, the first one, which is 1,500 base pairs long, could be pretty reasonable target size for a gene, has a really high score and a really good match. So this is a very, very good one. Um, the second one, also a fairly long one, also has a pretty high match. This number, by the way, is the closer to zero this number is, the better our match is. And this is 3 times uh, 10 to the minus 47. So 0. 0.0000000000. <laughs> anyway, that's a really, really good match, almost uh, almost certainly that that is that exact gene. This one's a very high match also. Notice that our third match, not only is it a little bit shorter, which maybe gives us some red flags, but those numbers drop significantly. And so it looks like for this database, we have identified two separate genes that are opsin genes. Now, the cool thing about this is we could do this for any gene we wanted. So let's just Pick a random gene. Now, you may not be super familiar with Drosophila genes, but let's let's see if we can find one. I'm gonna. I know a little bit about it, so let's go back to our um, NCBI and let's look for um, our a different gene. Let's say I don't know. Um, oh, let's just let's just pick a. Uh, housekeeping gene. Okay, let's look for ATP synthase. How's that? Okay, so nucleotide. Um, uh, 
um, ATP synthase uh, bu -bu -bu, secretion. That's the one that's related. There may be lots of genes that are going to be kind of similar. Maybe this is not the best one. Well, let's do this. Since we um, already found actin, let's see if we can, one of the actins, let's see if we can find a myosin protein. Okay, so there we have Drosophila melanogaster uh, for myosin. Uh, bu -bu -bu. Now there's a gene called spaghetti squash. That's kind of an interesting one. Uh, I'm, I want to do myosin, and I, I could do this one. I don't know what pendant, I don't know what species that one's coming from. So maybe we just need to limit it to Drosophila. So we have the uh, that's from a mollusk. So let's do this. So we make sure we have a good chance of finding what we're looking for. Let's look for a myosin just in Drosophila. So I'm going to change this to taxonomy. Uh, make sure I've got the right group. I'm going to click on that. Click on the nucleotides available for Drosophila. And now I'm going to search for myosin. So I've limited my search to only Drosophila. We get lots of chromosomes. Uh, spaghetti squash. Maybe that is a, a variant of my myosin. It looks like something is. So I don't know enough about this, but here's a heavy chain transcript variant. So here's myosin heavy chain. Maybe this is a good one to do just to be on the safe side. Maybe we'd find, in fact, we'll do both. Why not? We'll do search for spaghetti sauce, spaghetti squash. Kind of a cool name and also for this heavy chain. Okay, so here it is. I want just the coding region. Uh, I'm going to cut and paste this into a full file. So we'll do a, there we are. Ooh, it's a big long one. So I'm gonna copy that out and we'll put it here alongside ops. And actually let's get rid of the ops and so we, cause we've already done that search. So here I have my myosin heavy chain. Let's change the name. We'll get rid of all those carriage returns like we did before. So that's a good enough name. And let's do the one for spaghetti squash also. My guess is it's related to myosin because it was coming up under a keyword squash. Now there are lots of transcript variants. Those usually have changes in the non-coding. So it probably doesn't matter which one we choose. Um, we're only going to use the coding region here. So I'm going to take coding region. Fast format. Here we go. Oh, it's a very short gene. So we got one short gene and one long gene that we're looking for. Uh, here we are. Put this at the end. All right. So now I'm just going to get rid of uh, those carriage returns again. So I just have. Um, there we go. We got one long one. So now I've got uh, my first one mRNA carriage return. And then I got to find now the other one, this really short gene. Oh, there it is. mRNA, enter. It's going to be at the end of there. Sorry, just going to take me a little while. There's the name. Okay. So now this is in the proper format. And um, I've got the first gene and then the sequence. I've got the second gene and then the sequence. I'm just going to save this. I will save this as myosin. Oh, it did no name. I think it's going to go. Yeah, it's in the same place. I just need to change the name. So now let's go back to that folder. Here we go. This is our Drosophila myosin genes. I'll just say Drosophila DM melanogaster myosin. Okay. And now I'm going to run this exact same search. Now I'm going to come back here to command line. I can put this exact same commands in here by pushing the up arrow. And now I'm going to say, rather than searching for the, using that opsin one as my query, I'm going to use this Drosophila melanogaster myosin and run the exact same search, but with a different query sequences, actually two query sequences. So we'll have two results in our output. Um, I think I forgot to change the output file, so we probably lost the original one. I'd have to redo that. But So here we go. Let's change the name before we forget. This is actually um, web spinner myosin. You have to be careful not to overwrite files. But anyway, it's not too much effort to regenerate that original one. So here we are. Here we have our um, Drosophila myosin heavy chain is our first one. And sure enough, look at this. We found a whole series of this housekeeping in myosin's a big family. So notice we found all these others with really good high matches also. Let's look at that spaghetti squash one just for the heck of it. It's going to be probably down a ways. Boo, 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 maybe. 
I'll have to search for it. It's query. Here's our next one. Okay, so here is um, uh, boo, 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 sorry. I want query equals. Okay, so here we are. Here's our spaghetti squash gene, and yep, sure enough, look, we're finding a bunch, and these might be some of the same ones if that uh, is a version of myas in the spaghetti squash gene. So that is how we do a target gene approach. So I'm going to ask you in the worksheet, you know, briefly describe how we would search for a specific target gene in our transcriptome. And you would say, well, we'd make a local BLAST database. We would find a reference gene that is part, you know, a close relative of what we're looking for. And then we would use that reference gene as the query to search our local BLAST database and assess whether or not we have genes that are similar enough to be good examples. In this case, we found results in both. We found op uh, two opsin genes, and then we found a series of genes that were part of the myosin family of genes using those different queries. And again, we could do that for any gene we wanted, right? So to finish up, I'm going to talk you through just kind of briefly one other application that is very widely used, but it requires a little bit more detail and also some more uh, effort and resources than we had for this class, but it is in this final one here for differential expression. So let's say that I wanted to determine whether or not two genes that I knew about were differentially expressed in two different tissue samples. So for instance, is there a gene that is overexpressed in skin cancer cells as compared to uh, healthy cells, right? Or what about um, Cells, you know, is there genes that are expressed in a developing leg that are different than in a developing antenna? So to do that, of course, I would need two different tissue samples. And in fact, to do this, what I need, and uh, I'll, in fact, let's make a list here. And then I'll have a question for this later on, but here I'm just going to list it. So for different expression, we need two or more tissues that we want to compare. Okay, then after that, not only do we need two or more tissues, but we need multiple replicates from each tissue. Now, the reason for this is because if we do a single transcriptome, there are going to be potentially some issues with that. We may not have sampled uh, evenly across all of the uh, mRNAs that were present in that original sample. There might be artifacts of sequencing. There might be uh, errors in uh, protocol in the lab. So a single replicate doesn't really give us a great, uh, 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 a, a statistically significant place to start, let's say it that way. And so typically, we do three or more. Three is typically standard, that if we have three and all three of those uh, agree with one another, then we can be fairly certain that we have a good representative. So three uh, replicates is usually what we want to do. All right, and then when we do that, now that we've got three replicates from each of those tissues, we can compare and we can say, hey, look, in sample A, I sequenced gene X 50 times. Uh, and maybe it's 58 times in the second replicate and 56 times in the other replicate. So we've got, you know, a pretty good uh, congruence between those different replicates for that same sample. But then I say in sample B, which is maybe a different physiological condition or a different area of the body or a healthy versus a diseased uh, tissue, then we say, oh, but look, in this one, I, I hit and I found that same gene um, 560 times, 10 times as much as I found it in the original sample. So differential expression allows us to say, and then often, depending on the results, we will then confirm differential expression results for interesting genes, and then we can use those genes and study them for the disease process or the developmental process or whatever. But usually we confirm the differential expression results by doing a qPCR. And a qPCR is a process that allows us to quantitatively measure the amount of the starting material in our sample. So we go back to those original tissue samples and do a qPCR, and that is a second independent confirmation of the levels of gene expression in those tissues. Okay. So that pretty much takes us all the way through transcriptome assembly and a little bit of transcriptome analysis. You're going to see some additional questions that I have answered uh, uh, as we went through this. Make sure you go through, answer those questions in the lab. 
save your Word document and turn that in as an attachment. And then once you've done that, you can go into the questions, the lab questions, which will be just the exact same thing. I'll just sample some of the questions that you've already answered. So just cut and paste those answers into the lab questions assignment and turn that in. If you have anything you want to go over, if you're uncertain about any of those lab questions, I'm happy to review those with you. Send me an email, log on during Zoom office hours, and I'm happy to go over it with the answers. to it. That's important because remember those same exact questions in multiple choice form are going to be on your lab final.